God's love. Elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. What we established in the very first teaching is that God is just like Jesus. 100% like Jesus. The prophets may have seen something of God, but they only saw a glimpse. God is exactly like Jesus. Some of the scripture verses that we looked at as we thought of that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, Hebrews 1, 3. Jesus is the express image of God's person, the, the exact image. So it's not like, well, you know, we see a little bit of God in Jesus, and then, the, you know, others fill in a little few pieces of the puzzle here or there. No, no, Jesus is it. Colossians 1.19, it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. Not, not some of it, uh, and not, not part of it, but everything there is to know of God is in Jesus. So when people try to come and say, well, God is this or God is that, you say, is that what I see in Jesus? Otherwise, that view must fall to the ground and surrender to Jesus. Colossians 2, 9 says, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So it's not just like Jesus' spirit, you know, spirit of Jesus. No, what we see in Jesus physically, Jesus touching healing, lifting, condemning religion, lifting up the downtrodden, that is 100% the way God is. Jesus said in John 14, 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus says, look no further. You want to know what Father God is like? Look at me. Look at me. I, I, I show you who God is. And so we began this teaching several weeks ago by saying, you know, that many people develop their own ideas of God, never mind all the religions of the world in Christianity. People seem to have chapter and verse for all kinds of renditions of God. One way to illustrate it is by showing billboards that well-meaning people have put up to try to communicate from God to the general public. I have several billboards. Let's put them up one by one. Look at this one. You think it's hot here. Uh, obviously, this is a summertime billboard, but somebody is trying to tell their community, you think it's getting hot? Well, there's another very hotter place. So what, what image of God does this put forth? It's God the bully. He's bullying the people. <laughs> wait, you're perspiring now. You wait. Is that Jesus? Is that how Jesus was. Let's look at another one. I saw that. that. This is the micromanaging God. Don't think you got away with something. Is that endearing to you? Is this the kind of God you want to fellowship with who is forever scrutinizing you? And yet people, Christians, in the name of God, in the name of Christ, put up these billboards. These are actual billboards. I didn't make them up. Let's go to the next one. This one is the same theme. Jesus is watching you. And then I saw in the distance the adult video store. I, I'm sure some well-meaning person is thinking this will be bad for the adult video store business. They probably mean well. But is that the God revealed through Jesus? Is that what Jesus said when the woman caught in adultery? was cast at his feet. I, I saw it. You didn't get away. With, no, is that, is that, is that, or is it the goodness of God that brings people to change, or is it intimidation from God? Look at the next one. <laughs> Worship at our church or burn forever. Uh, that's not bad. Look at the name of the church. First Church of God's Perfect Love. Wow. Doesn't that make you want to go to that church? I mean, they're saying, we, we're the ones. There's nobody else. We're the ones. This is how people look at God. 
Let's go to the next one. Now suddenly, the billboard is from Satan, but it's kind of a similar theme. I guess God and Satan, according to these people, speaks roughly the same thing. And here Satan says, your pretty face is going to hell. Don't you want to go to that church? <laughs> okay, now here, I think that I, th this is my favorite one. <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite Christian billboard. Don't make me come down there. In, in other words, get the threat, because you know, if I come down there, you're going to get a beating. And, but then as I looked at that, I thought, whoops. Whoops, I think they forgot something. Didn't he already come down here? Yeah. I, I think he actually did come down here full of grace and mercy and truth, full of love, full of love saying, come to me, all you that are tired and heavy burdened by religion, and I will give you rest. Who is God? Jesus says, look at me. And I show you what God is like. So I want to give you just three descriptions of God. Number one, God is the great pursuer. The great pursuer. Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also, referring to Zacchaeus, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He is the great pursuer. Now we think often of Jesus' mission at the cross and the resurrection, and certainly Christ's finished work at the cross is the climax of the reason why Jesus came. But in fact, Jesus' mission was in full swing long before the cross. From the time he began his ministry, he was showing people who God is. And he's saying, God is like that, the great pursuer. He is seeking after people. He is saving people. He's helping people. And then he says, this man Zacchaeus here, he's the son of Abraham. That would have been a shock to the people. He, the thief, the one who has signed over to help the Romans to oppress us? Yes, Jesus says, he, he, I know he's been ostracized. You think he's an alien to God, but I got news for you. He's the son of Abraham. The covenant is for him. And you know, of course, today, the truth is this, that God has made a covenant with the world. And so God so loved the world. Jesus took the sins of the world. And God's love extends to every human being. Imagine if you lost something. Imagine, ladies, you, you just got engaged, and then your engagement ring lost. I mean, wouldn't that make you a little bit frantic? And you're looking everywhere, and you look twice, and gone. Imagine if, if, if you're out on a picnic, and you have a one-year-old, two-year-old, toddler, let's say a two-year-old, and, and Suddenly, you, you, you get talking to people, and then you don't see your child. Imagine the panic, the, 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 the concern, what, what happened? Where is my boy? You know, this is, this is describing how God feels towards people. These are small, just images that I'm painting for you. Of, of, of you lose something, whether it's expensive, whether it's just meaningful to you. It, it, this, is, this unwraps for us who God is. God is a pursuer. And there's no indication of any of these stories, whether it's about the sheep or the lost coin or the lost son in Luke 15, that the father somehow needed to be paid. You need to make it right. No, no, God just loves unconditionally. And the mission of Jesus is here is not to seek payment to God for the bad that people have done, but Jesus is on a mission to enlighten, to bring light to our minds that have become darkened so we don't see who God is and we don't see who we are to God. We don't see how precious, how valuable we are to God. And the word lost is not a derogatory word. You're lost. It's, it's something precious is missing. 
It's God's word. It's not a word that we use about other people. It's what God says. That precious person, that man, that woman, I I love them. They don't know of my love. They are missing from my table, but I want them at my table. That's Jesus. God is the great redeemer. You know, we're probably familiar with the word redeem in the context of you get a coupon and you redeem it at the store and it says no cash value. <laughs> and so you redeem that coupon. You, 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 you get the value for it. You, you, you recover whatever is the embedded value in that coupon. Sometimes we use the word redeem in terms of uh, making things right or make up for something. Maybe if somebody did very poorly, but then they redeemed themselves. Jesus is showing us that God is the great redeemer. He makes things right, even where things have been wrong. Israel, they were in slavery, but God redeemed them. God makes things right. Actually, in the Bible, in Israel, they had laws of redemption. You can find it in the book of Leviticus. There were laws of redemption for sure. No matter what else went wrong in your life, every 50th year was a year of jubilee where everything would be redeemed. I mean, you didn't have to wait for 50 years, but for sure, if everything else had failed, every 50th year. Now, Israel rarely practiced this in their history, but it was God's provision. If you lost your fortune, you lost your inheritance, you lost your freedom, you became a slave, every 50th year, God says, I'm going to make everything all right. I'm going to redeem the whole situation. And you see, when Jesus came in his first sermon, he announced to the people, I am your jubilee. He said, I have come, Luke 4, 19, I think it is, he says, I have come to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year is another term for every 50th year. He says, I'm your redeemer. I make things right. You see, when it says in the Bible that God is just, we tend to think in human terms. We think about the justice department. We think of the ministry of justice. And, and so we think about prisons and punishment because human justice basically is not to make things right. Human justice is to punish appropriately. That there is no such thing as justice making things right, or at least it's very rare. There's only punishment. So our human definition of justice is punishment, and that's why we often take our human definition, making God in our own image just like us, and we think that God's justice is just like our justice, all the more perfect. So for example, if you speed and you go 20 miles above the speed limit or 30 miles or 50 kilometers over, then you will get a fine. Don't look at me like this has never happened to you. And it'll be whatever, $100, whatever society has decided. You're not going to go to prison for life over that, by the way. But, 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 but you're going to get some fine. That's kind, of, you know, that, that's kind of justice. But take a murder. Well, how do you get justice when somebody's murdered? There is no justice. There is no making it right. You say, well... Some might say, well, I think the death penalty is the justice. That person who did it should die, but it still doesn't make anything right. If you lost your son and, or your daughter in a murder, they're not brought back to the Christmas table just because somebody else died, died took the, the death penalty. So, so, so the best we can do, whatever we think about that, whether there should be life in prison or whatever people think, different people think different things. Whatever they think, there's no justice, there's only punishment. But God's justice It's not about punishment. It's about making everything right. Everything right. I want to restore everything to you. And every 50th year in Israel, if it wasn't done right in that long time period, at least every 50th year, God says, I'm making a provision that everything is going to be right for everybody. But you know, most people didn't have to wait that long because they had another provision called a relative redeemer or You know, another word is the kinsman redeemer, where you had a next of kin who would buy your freedom. You remember in the story of Ruth, 
Boaz became her kinsman redeemer, buying a free. So that meant at any time, at any time, you don't have to wait for 50 years, any time a relative near to you who was willing and able could buy your freedom. You could be redeemed. And here's, of course, the great picture, Jesus Christ. Yes, He is a year of Jubilee, but you don't have to wait every 50th year, as some people suggest nowadays. No, He is your kinsman redeemer. Any time, any place, he, what He has provided for you is enough. You are free. You have your inheritance. God makes everything right. Uh, Paul told us the price, uh, Ephesians 1, 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. We have this making things right. We have this buyback, this freedom bought for us through the blood of Jesus. You know, who did Jesus pay His blood to? Well, I submit to you that Jesus made a payment to death its, itself. He gave His life surrendered his life, laid it down to death itself. You know, in the Greek mythology, Hades, which we in our Bible translate as hell or the kingdom of, of death, was actually the Greek god of death. And so when they said Hades, they were talking about death, the kingdom of death. And Jesus gave his blood, gave his life, not because he owed something to death. No, he is life, so he owes nothing to nobody. But by giving himself to death, he there made, by made death an entry point. Follow me closely here. Death became the entry point whereby Jesus could go down into the kingdom of death, which the Bible talks clearly about. He went down and declared victory to all principalities and powers. He preached to those who had died before. He went down, and the church father used to call this the victory raid. You know, in a war you might have a victory raid. Well, Jesus had a victory raid straight into hell, conquering principalities and powers. You remember when I preached on Easter Sunday, I told you that nowadays on Easter, the most popular symbol we have of Easter is the empty tomb, and that's a great symbol. But I said for the first 1,000 years of the church, the empty tomb was not the picture of, of, of resurrection. It was not the symbol. Rather, they had a, a picture of Jesus standing in a ray of light in hell, and you could see little creepy, dirty, crawly creatures under his feet, demons, principalities, and powers. In his left hand, he had an empty cross, and he had a keychain standing like this over the devil, over principalities and powers, with a keychain, with an empty cross. And with his right hand, he reached into Adam's tomb. He, the last Adam, unraveled everything that the first Adam had messed up. And he gives new life to everyone who will believe on him. Oh, this is beautiful. Uh, now, now we're talking about redemption. Let me read it to you. Revelation 1, 17. Fear not, I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of Hades and of death. He is the great redeemer. God is the great redeemer. To, to redeem a situation or to redeem a person is to make things all right for that person. That, that situation and its negative effects are canceled by the grace of God. Well, that, that's what God has made available to you. And you see the prayer request right here. I want you to go to your telephone. And before the end of the telecast today, we're going to lay hands on these and believe God for you. I talked about God being the great pursuer. God wants you. God loves you. Maybe you want to say yes to that. Well, why don't you call the number on the screen and, and say, I, I, I want to know more how I can say yes to God. And let me send you this booklet, Salvation, God's Gift to You. It's absolutely free. We've given out millions of this around the world. I want to give it to you. A new year is starting. Uh, new opportunities, new challenges, and we believe God for His anointing, His presence, His power for you in 2016. But what better way than to take a look at my other free book. These are free, postage paid, no obligation. My other little booklet, Himself, which is really written to help release this anointing of Christ 
that is yours for 2016. Here's how you can have it. Peter Youngren presents the Himself Booklet by A.B. Simpson, The Glorious Reality of Christ in You. Peter is offering this as a free gift, so please call now to order your personal copy. Call 1-800-275-2713 and request your free gift today. He is the great Redeemer, but He's also the great Physician. Mark 2, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here, sin, our alienation from God, is described as a disease that needs the doctor's attention. And the great doctor is God, revealed through Jesus Christ. Disease, and and, and the patient is humanity. So again, the description is not here, humanity in in, in a picture of indebtedness or needing punishment. I mean, when somebody is sick, you don't beat them up. No, sin is the fatal disease. Sin is a broken relationship, and all the side effects of our broken relationship with God brings on all these ugly symptoms, and ultimately death. Some of you may remember was it 20 years ago now when we first became aware of AIDS? Remember the AIDS epidemic and, and people didn't know what it was and the fear and, and, and the cover-ups and denials and well, here Jesus says this alienation from God, this humanity's broken relationship with God, it's a disease. And, and, and implied is here that the presence of the great doctor, Jesus Christ, who is God, the great doctor, has medicinal effects on the patient. Because just like the venom of the snake permeates the entire body, so when alienation from God, a broken relationship, sin, going in the wrong direction, missing the mark, aiming at the wrong target. You know, I've used all these definitions to describe what sin is. What it does, it affects our total being. It affects us emotionally. It affects us mentally. It affects us spiritually. And it even has physical effects. But Jesus, as the great physician, he's not a, he's not a pill dispenser. He's not a doctor who just gives you a prescription, say, go to the pharmacy and take these pills three times a day and hope something happens in 30 days. Because that's what we have made God into. Especially we word people. Say, so who is that? If you don't know, don't worry about it. Uh, because we think it's all, oh, you know, is this verse, this verse. We, we take these verses like pills and hope things will get better. But you see, Jesus is not the great physician as in the dispenser of pills. He is the physician. What we have here is the picture of the great physician entering the patient. The patient is mankind. The great physician entered the human race. He let the venom... He let the venom of the disease spread through every part of his being. He took the full ugly effects of the disease of sin. He took death itself, and he conquered it, unraveled it, and he rose again. Now that's the word of the Lord. Now, thank God for every scripture verse, every chapter, every verse. But but those are scriptures. They're valuable. But the Word is Jesus Himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. When I preached the Word, I preached Jesus Christ. Now, I quote lots of scriptures, but He is the Word. And He totally is the great physician. Identified with the human situation. Have you ever thought of Jesus on the cross? How weak God looks. How weak he looks. In fact, many pagan religions, they mock us for that reason. He looks very weak. He is suffering the epitome of human weakness. Every shame, every taunt, every mockery, every mental duress, he's suffering. That, that's our God. And we're saying, who is God? Who is God? 
Is he the one who is in a high, lofty place, not able to look at sin or wickedness? Well, we dealt with that a few weeks ago. Of course not. He's the great pursuer. You may turn your back on God, but God will not oblige by turning his back on you because he is seeking and saving everyone that's missing from his table. I don't know. What, what do you think? Isn't God pretty awesome? Yes. I, I, isn't God great? Oh. He loves you. He's welcoming you. As you notice on the lower screen, you've seen this album advertised throughout the program, Who Really Is God? I, I think is one of the greatest, most important teachings I've ever released, maybe the most important because there's so many misrepresentations, so many grotesque views of God that really hinder us from receiving. And we really need to see Jesus, uh, how he reveals God and see God through Jesus. So this teaching is available. You call the number on your screen to order that and, and for your own personal spiritual growth for maybe give it to your pastor, give it to a, a friend and uh, share it with your Bible study group or, or most of all, just enjoy it for your own spiritual enrichment. Uh, you will be very much inspired and helped by that teaching. In a moment, we're going to pray for these prayer requests. I just came back before Christmas from Guinea, West Africa. And uh, you know that country, 88% of Muslims in the capital where we were, Conakry, 95% estimated to be Muslims. And God helped us to touch people and, and people groups that have no gospel witness. They were touched. And of course now, invitations are coming from all over that part of, of Islamic dominated Africa. And amazingly, God is opening doors for us. So we need your help more than ever. Please go to the telephone and help us right now because our missions account has been depleted by what we did. And we need to say yes to these challenges and opportunities. To say no would be a tragedy. Uh, let's believe God right now. Father, I thank you for the grace of God that you showed to the people in Guinea, West Africa. The people have suffered so much. Now, I thank you for the same grace of God, the same anointing in the name of Jesus being released to you right now without limitations. Just say, thank you, Jesus, and then draw on that energy of God that created everything. Let me hear what God has done for you in life. Keep calling and remember you are loved. Thank you. Your partnership makes this ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands who have never heard, call 1-877-974-7223. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at PO Box 2108, Vista, California, 92085-2108 or 190 Railside Road, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M3A 1A3. Together, let's give everyone a chance to hear the gospel.